Amen. Thank you, Brother Matthew. All right, good afternoon. So, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to be preaching on the nature of the devil. The nature of the devil. So, we've just read from Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus is being tempted by the devil, but we're going to start in Ezekiel 28. So, if you turn to Ezekiel chapter 28, and first of all, I guess, looking at the nature of the devil, we're going to look at his origin. You know, who is the devil and where did he come from? And in Ezekiel chapter 28, certainly sheds some light on the origin of the devil. Starting in verse 13, the Bible reads, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Sardius, topaz and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald and the carbuncle and gold the workmanship of thy tab- tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So firstly, the first point here is, well, we can see that he's a cherub here and this is definitely about the devil as we go further through this, this chap- this, um, these verses here, you'll see this clearly, but we can see he's adorned in all these precious stones and also that he's a created being. All right? The devil is a creation, like well, when he was a cherub originally here, which we'll see, He's a creation of God. So God didn't create him as the devil originally. He was a cherub. And he was a very special cherub, as we're about to see. Because in verse 15, so it says here in verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So it says the anointed cherub, not an anointed cherub. So there's something about this cherub that makes him really special. And I think this is why it gives us this description in verse 13 about all these precious stones that are adorning the cherub, he stood out. He was the anointed cherub. The, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So we can see, and now here's the thing. Now, it's not within the scope of this sermon to look at what a cherub is exactly, but look, just to cut it short, they're a type of angel. A cherub is a type of angel. In the book of Ezekiel, it gives a, lot, a big description of what a cherub is. Um, that's something that you might want to study in your own time or somebody might preach a sermon on that. But in verse 15 it says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So when he was created, he was perfect. There was no sin in this cherub. But then iniquity was found in him in verse 15. And why did the cherub sin? Why did the devil commit this sin? We're going to find out here, it explains it. In verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So I'll just stop there. The Bible's teaching us here that the heart of this cherub, who is to become Satan, the devil, was lifted up because of his beauty. So we can see he's a beautiful cherub. He's got all these stones adorning him. He's the anointed cherub. So he, he, was, he was a special cherub. And it, what, what happened to Satan, this cherub, is that his own, by his own beauty, he became vain. And he was lifted up by those around him. If you can imagine, if he's the anointed cherub and he stands out, then obviously all these other cherubs and other angels in heaven, they're looking up to him. They're admiring his beauty. They're probably saying nice things about him, right? This went to his head. He became vain because of beauty, just something so simple, but this is what the Bible's teaching. So he became vain in his thoughts, and it says, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So the wisdom that the cherub had, that Satan had, he was corrupted because of his brightness, because he was so beautiful, because he was so bright, it was corrupted. And, and the God says, I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee up before kings, that they may behold thee. So here we, he's overcome by his own vanity. Right? It's something just so simple. Just so, it, it, to me, that's crazy, but this is the origin of how Satan, this cherub, becomes the devil. And in verse 18, it says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I bring thee forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished 
at thee. Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more. So here the Bible speaking of his, his demise at the end and we're going to go into that a little bit further in the sermon, you know, the ultimate end of the devil. But it's just interesting seeing this origin and, and how this sin was first found in him and it was just through his own vanity. And it, it sort of, it makes sense, I guess, because if we look at 2 Corinthians 11, no need to turn there, I'll just read the verses. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. This is how he wants to appear. You know, he, he's this cherub, this anointed cherub. He was beautiful, adorned with all these costly stones. He wants to appear as this angel of light. He loves his own beauty. He's vain. And his vanity was his own undoing. And, and also in verse 15, it says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So point number one here, the point I want to make is that the origins of the devil are that he was a cherub, the anointed cherub, and he's a fallen angel. He's a fallen cherub. This is his origin. This is where he came from. He was created by God. He was created perfect, but then sin was found in him. Now, in the Bible, the devil has many different names. And we're going to see this as we go through some of these verses. He's got many different names. And look, I'll just rattle off some of them. There's probably more than this. This might not be comprehensive, but these are the ones that I found. So there's the devil, Satan, Beelzebub, Baal, Belial, father of lies, dragon, prince of this world, prince of the power of the air, serpent, the wicked one, the god of this world, Lucifer, and son of the morning. And you know, some of you this, morning, this afternoon, you might be thinking, why would you preach an entire sermon about the devil? Shouldn't we be you know, shouldn't I preach about God? Shouldn't, shouldn't we preach on some other topic, right? I mean, who really wants to know about the devil? Well, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. There's a good reason to preach on this topic. Now, look, I'm not excited about preaching about the na nature of the devil. It's not something that I wake up in the morning and think, yes, I'm going to preach a sermon about the nature of the devil. But there's a good reason for this, and you know, at the end of the day, we should preach on all topics in the Bible. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it reads, uh, actually, I'll start, I'm going to read first, I'll read verse 11 first. In verse 11, it says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's making this point that he's not ignorant of the devices of the devil. And it, the devices is another word for, you know, schemes. The devil has his schemes, right? And, and what we're going to look at this afternoon is some of the schemes that he comes up with, some of his tactics. And obviously, if someone's ignorant of the devil's devices, then the devil, it's easier for the devil to take advantage of that person, right? So we don't want to be ignorant of his schemes, right? And this is why we're looking at this topic. And just for context, if you, if you look at verse 10 there, it says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also... For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I, forgave I it in the person of Christ. So the context here in regards to, you know, not being taken by the devil is make sure you've got forgiveness in your heart, right? That's the context of this particular verse. But look, there's other devices, you know, there's other schemes that the Bible uses other than just trying to corrupt your heart and create bitterness in your heart, either towards God or towards your fellow brother and sister in Christ, right? He's got other devices, but that's one of them. One of them is to create bitterness in your heart against your brothers and sisters and against God. And 1 Peter 5 verse 8, this is, you know, this is a popular verse, all, we all know this one, but it reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Point number two, the devil is our adversary. He is our adversary. He is against us. Make no mistake, we are in a spiritual battle. And so, you know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Our battle is spiritual and Satan is pulling the strings of a lot of things that happen in this world. This is why he has that title, Prince of, the, of this world, Prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, because he does have power and he does manipulate things. And, and the Bible teaches us to put on the, the whole armour of God. That's a famous chapter in the Bible, you know, Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians 6, 11, it, it reads, Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, wiles, you know, by, by definition, it's, 
devious or cunning stratagems employed in manipulating or persuading someone to do what one wants. So that's what, when it says, you know, to stand against the wiles of the devil, we're standing against his efforts and strategies and his schemes that are set against us. Now, the, the devil schemes against us. He's plotting right now. He's, I can guarantee you right now he's plotting, how can I take down New Life Baptist Church? He's plotting it right now. And he might get to some individuals, some of the individuals in this church. I hope not. I pray that that doesn't take place. But that's why I'm preaching this sermon. Because we don't want him to get a foothold here. But also in, in Ephesians 6, if we just, like it, it teaches us to put on the whole armour of God, right? We want to put on the whole armour of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. But I want to make this point. In verse 16, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, above all, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall, stand, be able to, shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So our main tool against Satan is faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Standing firm in our faith, that's our main tool to fend off the fiery darts of the devil. And it calls him the wicked. This is talking about the devil here. Because we can, back in verse 11, it says that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. So this is all about making a stand against the devil, making a stand against his schemes, and we do that by putting on the whole armour of God, but particularly the shield of faith. The times in your life where you become faithless or have doubts and you stumble, they're the times when Satan will come after you the hardest because he'll spot that weakness in the armour. Right. He'll see that shield of faith down and he'll find a chink in the armour. He'll find a spot where he'll get you. He'll bring some sort of temptation in your life that might overcome you if you've got that shield down. You're defenceless at that point if that shield of faith is down. So point number two, the, the devil is our adversary. And, and we're going to look at an example of this if we turn to the book of Job. Turn to the book of Job, chapter, uh, chapter one. Actually, no, I think that reference is wrong. I think it's chapter two. Job chapter two. Verse six. Oh, maybe it is chapter one, sorry. Yeah, chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You know, here we can see Satan coming, you know, he's with the sons of God up in heaven before the Lord. And it's not Satan that brings Job up. I'm going to make that point first. The Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? So think about that. And it's, it becomes clear that here we see God allows Satan to test Job. God allows Satan to test Job's faith. And also, the point about Job too is that he's the most upright man in the entire earth at this, at this point in time. That's what the Bible teaches. He's the most righteous man on earth at this time. And we know the story, you know, all of Job's livestock were slaughtered, his servants were slaughtered, all of his children were slain. And, you know, Job had 10 children. This is horrific, right, what Job goes through. He had 10 children that were, that were all slain all at the hands of Satan, the devil. And, you know, some people might think, well, this is a bit cruel of the Lord to allow Satan to inflict this kind of pain and punishment on Job. And there are many that, you know, th this can be a stumbling block for some people, you know, to come to faith in, in God too. You know, what kind of a God is this that allows this kind of mayhem and chaos to take place? Why doesn't God stop Satan from doing this? I mean, this is, this is pretty cruel, right? 
on the surface it seems that way. And in Job 1 verse 20 it says, Then Job arose, so if you skip down to verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And watch this in verse 22. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. So here Job is attributing what's happened to him by the Lord, that the Lord has gave and the Lord took away from him. And even in saying this, he did not sin. Now we know from reading the passage, it's clear to us that Satan did all this, but it's because God allowed it. And that's why it wasn't a sin for Job to say that the Lord has given him and the Lord has taken away. And I want to make this point, this could happen to any one of us here. This same scenario. Now, I hope not. I mean, I don't want to go through something like this in my life. I'm sure most of you feel the same way, but it, it could happen. It could happen and how are you going to respond you know now if you don't have that shield of faith up you're certainly not going to respond to this sort of situation these circumstances in the way job did but job's response just shows us that he had that shield of faith up even though the devil came at him took everything he had now at this point he hasn't harmed him physically but that happens later on So the point I want to make here is that you know, Satan, even though he, God allows him to do these things, he's just a pawn. Satan is ultimately a pawn of God, for God to use, to achieve his purpose. Because the Lord knew what, what Job could cope with. So the Lord allowed Job to go through this, have his faith tested and refined. And Satan merely just becomes a pawn for God's purpose. And that brings me to point number three in the the sermon is that the Lord uses the devil for his purpose. So even though Satan goes about causing all this mayhem and chaos and he can inflict us in our lives if the Lord allows it, right? Even though he, he does this, you know, it's ultimately for the Lord's purpose. It's for his goals, right? It's for his goals. It's for his glory. It's for the Lord's glory at the end of the day. And just to really prove this point here, because there's a couple of verses in the Bible in the Old Testament, this is in First Chronicles and Second Samuel, where it appears to be a contradiction in the Bible on the surface. And in First Chronicles 21 verse 1 it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now if, if, if you don't know that, you know, they were commanded not to take a census, the Israelites, they were not to number their men. Now, I believe the reason for this is because God wanted them to use their, to be faithful to the Lord and trust in Him for their victories. So the Lord didn't want them to number the men because He didn't want them to be trusting in their numbers. How many men they had that they could take into battle. The Lord didn't want them to take any census or number them. And, you know, Satan provokes David to number them. That's really clear. That's in 1 Chronicles 21. And then if we look at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 24 verse 1, it says, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. So which is it? Is it Satan that tempted David to do, commit this sin and do this census and number the men? Or was it the Lord that moved him to do it? The truth of the matter is there is no contradiction here. And we can tell that from, the exper- from Job's experience and what Satan did there. It's clear that what's happened with David is Satan, God allowed Satan to go to David and tempt him. Now, if David had that shield of faith up, he wouldn't have folded and given into the temptation and numbered them and taken the census. So you can see how, you know, and this allowed the Lord to judge Israel, to make a judgment against them in this case. Ultimately, it's just achieving the Lord's purpose, but it could have been a different outcome. If David had the shield of faith up and resisted the devil and didn't give into that temptation, the Lord wouldn't have judged Israel. He wouldn't have done this. So the Lord allowed Satan to tempt David and David faltered. David faltered. It could have been a different outcome. You know, these things, they're not set in stone. Now, just because God does know the end from the beginning, it doesn't mean that, you know, we we just give in to fate. Like, oh, this was just going to happen anyway. It's, It's not like that. It's not like that. This could have been a different outcome had David resisted the devil. And it's, look, how this applies to us, it's the same thing. Satan's going to come after us. If he went after David, he's going to go after you. If he went after Job, he's going to go after you. Now, he might not do it in the same fashion as what he did with Job. That was pretty 
crazy what Job went through. But he's going to come after us. And that's, what this, that's why I'm preaching on the nature of the devil. We need to be aware of his schemes and what he does. And look, also, it, this is in the New Testament. So this isn't just the Old Testament. Here in the New Testament, in Luke 22, verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And verse 32, here's some comfort for Peter, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. See, Satan makes requests to the Lord. Now, in, in the case of Job, we saw the Lord mention Job to Satan. Here it says Satan actually went to God and actually requested to sift Simon as wheat. So this was, this was you know, the, the devil in this case being proactive rather than reactive to the Lord making a suggestion, right? But it goes both ways. And it's ultimately for God's purpose, right? And, you know, I guess, you know, what are the devil's devices and how do we overcome them? We've seen how he behaves, some of the things he does. But now let's sort of look more at his, his nature, who he is and how he operates. Um, so we've already seen that he tries to turn people against God by hurting their friends or family or even by harming them directly. Um, in the case of, of Job, and other times he just directly tries to tempt an individual, you know, from within their heart, tries to plant ideas or seeds of doubt or whatever it might be. He knows, the devil knows you, right? And, and he knows how to push certain buttons. He knows what your weaknesses are, and, and he'll go after those. He's, he's, he knows what your strengths are. He's going to look for whatever weakness he can find. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we, we see a clear example of this. Now, to my knowledge, this is the, f the first recorded sin of the devil in the Bible, except for what we read in Ezekiel where the iniquity was found in him, you know, through his own vanity. But here we see the first sin that he commits against mankind. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, if you want to turn there, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, well, for starters, how do we know that the, the serpent here in the garden is the devil? I mean, this, this is just a serpent, right? It's just a snake. Well, in Revelation 22, it says, And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Like I said earlier, Satan has a lot of different names and titles throughout the whole Bible. One of them is Serpent. So this is definitely the devil. And look here how he, he, question, you know, he questions what God said straight away. That's his first thing, is like casting doubt. You know, hath God said? Hath he? Did he really say that? Now, in Genesis 2.16, just a chapter back, this is what the Lord actually says. <laughs> this, is, this is what God actually says. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. That's before the next verse where he talks about the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice how God words it. There's a lot of freedom. <laughs> you can eat of every tree of the garden. Whereas Satan says, You know, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, like you're missing out. You're missing out. You can't eat from every tree. But the Lord says they can eat of every tree, except in verse 17, where he just says that one tree they can't. Now in verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, Eve misquotes God here. It's, it's very subtle, but she's not quite right. Because God didn't say they couldn't touch it. Now, it's probably not a good idea to touch it, but, he didn't, but here's the thing, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. She's misquoting what God said. In verse 17 it says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Like, it's very clear, but God's not saying they can't touch it, but he's just saying they can't eat of it. So Eve, by adding to it, is kind of, she's misrepresenting what God says. And in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not sure, surely die. So he's just directly contradicting now what, what God has said. It's just really direct now. And in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, 
Then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan now is trying to appeal to Eve that there's something in this for you. You know, like I've already said, you're missing out on this tree. You know, God's not letting you eat from this tree. And the reason is because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know good and evil. Like he's trying to appeal to, you know, Eve that she, she's missing out on something here. And how often does the devil do that in our lives? Like try and make us feel like we're missing out on something, right? You know, oh, we, we live, you know, we try and live these righteous lives and, you know, we're missing out on all the fun that all the sinners have and look at what you can't do. He's just, he just tries to point out the things that we can't do. Like here, right? It's just one thing that they couldn't do, just one thing. Now, in our lives, there's more than just one thing that we can't do. We know the commandments. The, the, this is a big book. There's a lot of commandments in the Bible, right? Now, Adam and Eve, they, there was just this one thing they couldn't do and they couldn't keep this one commandment. The devil got to Eve, right? And so the devil tries to make this fruit of the tree look appealing. And, you know, it's because he's against mankind. And, and Satan's deception here, it causes the downfall of mankind. Like, the repercussions, the repercussions of this one act. All the pain, all the suffering that's, that's been in, in this world from that, that point in history, it's, it's, it's incredible, right? There's just so much pain and suffering. And in verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And in John 8, 44, talking about the nature of the devil here, it, this is Jesus, he says, Ye are of your father the devil. Now he's talking about the Pharisees, he's talking about a bunch of reprobate Pharisees here, where he says, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Listen to that. There is no truth in the devil. None. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now this brings me to my fourth point here. The devil is a deceiver. He is the father of lies. He is the creator of, of, of the lies. That, are, you know, that have run rampant from, <laughs> from his origins right up until the present day and into the future. He's, he's the father of all lies. And there is absolutely zero truth in the devil. He can't speak any truth. That's what the Bible teaches. He cannot speak any truth. And here we're going to see him even try and take on the Lord Jesus, which is, you know, you think that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> he's he's going to try and tempt Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, it, he's not going to stop at anything. Even though it's, it's Jesus, the Son of God, he's, he's so proud, he's so vain, that he somehow thinks that he can overcome the Son of God. That he can somehow get, tempt him to the point where he'll, he'll give in. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, where our Bible reading was from. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it reads, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. No kidding, right? <laughs> I mean, who, who here has fasted for more than, say, a day? One, two hands, more than two days? Three? Four? Three. Three is the most. So, 40 days. 40 days. He was hungry. Yeah, no kidding, right? Like, you could look at this and think, oh, it's the Son of God. He could easily go 40 days without food. He was in flesh and blood just like we are. Tempted in every way that we are. He didn't, and in fact, what we're going to see, even when Satan tries to tempt him, he could have supernaturally tried to overcome this hunger, but the hunger's real. That's what the Bible teaches. He's really hungry. So he wasn't using any of his powers to try and get through these 40 days and, you know, he's more special than anyone else in flesh and blood. No, and, and this is why the devil comes to tempt him. It, is, it, it appears at his weakest point. Truth of the matter is, I, I believe Jesus was really strong at this point, even though he was hungry. Fasting for 40 days would have brought him really close to the Lord. Right. Really close to his Father in heaven, right? Because 
he, he's got to, I mean, if you're going to fast for 40 days, you're going to be relying on your Father in heaven, right? And in verse 3 it says, And when the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, it's like, prove it. You know, prove your power. You know, if you, be, if you are really the Son of God, right? Command that these stones may uh, be made bread. So the devil tries to appeal to the power that Jesus has, right? And, you know, we, we can be tempted in the same way by the devil. You know, we've got our own needs and desires. Um, now, we, might, we don't have the same power that Jesus has. We don't have, you know, we, we can't be sinless, right? We can try our best, walk in the Spirit, try and be, live as righteously as we possibly can. But in this, we can also be tempted to trust in our flesh. So when the devil comes to us, you know, if we're hungry, we might cave. If we're trying to, I don't know, dedicate a certain period of time to the Lord where we've made a decision, we might want to fast for a period of time and, and give in, right? We can be tempted also and we need to resist. But in verse 4, he, here's how Jesus deals with the temptation. In verse 4 it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here we can see that Jesus uses the word of God to overcome his temptation. Right? He's using the sword of the Spirit to resist the temptation. So then what does the devil do in verse 5? Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and settleth, settleth, settleth on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee and their hands and they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. So Jesus uses the word of God to resist the devil. The devil's then like, okay, all right, I can use the word of God too. And here he's going to try and use it to try, he's twisting scripture here, right? He's, he's taking this passage out of context, this verse out of context, but he's trying to twist the scripture here to try and convince Jesus to do something sinful. And this, this tactic, right, of taking a verse out of context and twisting it, you know, false prophets love doing this sort of stuff, right? I mean, this is, this is their bread and butter. You know, just grab an isolated verse out of the Bible, take it out of context of the passage, twist it, and try and make people do things or believe things that are just contrary to Scripture, right? Contrary to Scripture. Now, how does Jesus deal with this? In verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So, Jesus quotes another verse, right? And it's not contrary to what the devil's quoting, but when you try and synergize these two verses, it's clear that we should ought not to be foolish to, you know, twist a verse out of, out of, out of context to try and tempt the Lord. Oh, Lord, you, you said that I wouldn't dash my foot upon a stone, so I'll just jump off a cliff. That's ridiculous, right? But, you know, it's, it's only, it's a, you know, this is what the false prophets do. Some of the things they teach are just completely ridiculous, right? Like, I'll give you an example. Hundreds of times throughout the Bible, the Scriptures clearly teach that salvation is by faith alone. It's just by grace through faith. It's just so clear. There's so many verses. But, you know, you've got a handful of verses when taken out of context, they twist them and they try and make them about salvation to teach people that they've got to work their way to heaven. And it's false. It's false. But, you know, that, that's, that's how they operate. And the devil operates in the same manner. And then in verse 8, oh, and also the point I want to make here is that here we see Jesus comparing Scripture with Scripture, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, and we, we need to do the same thing. We need to have a, a good, comprehensive knowledge of the whole Bible. That's our goal as Christians, as believers during our lives, is to read this through and through, over and over, have a comprehensive knowledge. So when someone does come at us, you know, and pulls a verse out of the Bible and confronts you with it and says, yeah, but what about this verse? You've got an answer, just like Jesus had for the devil here. You've got a way of trying to refute their manipulations or their twisting of Scripture or taking it out of context, right? Let's continue in verse 8. And again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto them, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Now this is, this, this verse here in particular, this is really loaded. There's so much in this. You could preach a whole sermon on this. Now, the point I want to make here is that Satan can't offer something to the Lord that he doesn't have the power to offer to begin with. Now, here we learn something about the devil that he can offer kingdoms. He can put rulers and kings in power. Why? Because the Lord allows him to do it. Now, ultimately, we know it's for God's purpose. 
that he allows Satan to do these sorts of things. This is how we end up with tyrants that end up in power at times, or evil rulers, right? It's like some people might think, well, how does, how does God allow this? To, there's verses in the Bible that teach that God institutes all these rulers and, and these kings and puts them in power. How does that jive when they're evil tyrants? Well, Satan's sometimes putting these people in power and giving them these kingdoms, and the Lord is allowing it ultimately for his own purpose. But, you know, this is a real temptation. Now, of course, we, we do see that, you know, Jesus refutes that in the next verse, where he says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and serve, uh, and him only shalt thou serve. And, but look, it's not just rulers and kings, right? It's, it's also, you know, some of these prosperity preachers that preach a prosperity gospel. Satan allows these guys to come to fame and fortune and, you know, sometimes attract a really big audience. That's the doing of Satan, in, just as in, in, in as much as you get kings and rulers that reign over large populations or entire countries, and sometimes they're tyrants. It's, it's no different. Now, in verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So we see here that when you do resist the devil, the angels will minister to you. They're going to come and, and support you and, and help you, you know. It's because it's not, we need that help. I mean, if Jesus needed angels to minister to him, how much more us, right? We, we need help in our, in our spiritual battle, right? And thankfully, we do have minister, angels that do minister to us and help us and support us and encourage us, right? And we can't see them, but they're there. So point five, the devil will appeal to your needs and desires. And what I want to look at now is how much power does the devil have? How much does he have? Like we can see, you know, he's obviously got quite a bit of power if he can make kings and rulers and give things and make these sorts of offerings to people to entice people just to create as much mayhem and chaos as he possibly can. But how much power does he have? In 2 Timothy 2 verse 25, the Bible reads, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. For the unsaved, for the unregenerate man, Satan has a lot of power over those particular individuals. The Bible describes them as being in a snare of the devil, and listen to this, they are taken captive by him at his will. They do the will of the devil. Anybody that's not saved, they cannot do the will of God. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. But not only that, they can only do the will of the devil. So keep that in mind. You know, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not, it's not like when we see these unsaved, unregenerate souls that we're against them because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? We're fighting against the principalities and the powers of the darkness and the rulers of this world, namely Satan. He is our adversary. They are not our adversary. Satan, the devil, is our adversary and they've been taken captive to do his will. So he has that power. And just to, just to reinforce this idea, you know, we have a, an example here in John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Now this is an extreme example here because this is Judas. And we know Judas was a reprobate. In John 13 verse 2 it says, and supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So, you know, at, at this point, Judas has made the decision that he's going to sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He's made that decision in his heart at this point. And if we skip down to verse 21 here, we're going to learn something else about the power that Satan has or the devil has. In verse 21, it says... When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. 
Now, this would be no different than, you know, people that become demon-possessed. Now, in this example here, it's specifically Satan himself that enters into Judas Iscariot, possesses him. He can possess the unsaved. Satan has this power. Now, it's after he's tempted and, and Judas has given into it, that's when he enters into Judas Iscariot. Now, I think there's certain individuals where Satan will handpick certain people where he will enter into them. We're going to see another example where he enters into the Antichrist, a little bit further into this sermon, but he has the power to do this. The other thing I want to point out about Judas is that the disciples were deceived by Judas. Judas had done such a good job that they had no idea that he was not saved and that he was a reprobate. Following in that ministry for three and a half years, he was able to conceal it for a lengthy period of time. And we ought not to be arrogant and think that, you know, we can somehow just pick out and spot all the phonies, right? <laughs> all the false believers. It's, if if the, the 11 that were with Jesus couldn't identify that Judas was, we, we ought not to be arrogant and think that we can always spot them, right? So we need to be on our guard. And, you know, but having said that, it doesn't mean that we go on a witch hunt, right? <laughs> we don't go on a witch hunt to try and find, oh, who amongst these congregations, you know, a reprobate potentially. We don't do that. But obviously, you know, when it becomes clear that somebody is a reprobate, we definitely reject them at that point. You know, Sam preached a great sermon this morning, you know, on imprecatory prayers and at what point, you know, we might pray that sort of prayer against someone. It's when they're identified, obviously. But here's the thing, the only power the devil has, so uh, the only power the devil has over us as children of God is when we're tested and we give in to temptation, right? Whereas with the unsaved, the devil just has unfettered access. They are taken captive to do his will. But for us, it's only when we give in to temptation. And here, the point I want to make too is in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, if you want to quickly turn there, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. The Bible reads, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So the thing about temptation, when the Lord does allow us to go through trials and you know, tribulations and allows Satan to, to tempt us, this is important. The Lord will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. What that tells me is if you give in to temptation, it's not because you couldn't bear it, it's because the shield of faith was down and you caved and you gave in. Right? So in the case of Job, Job, the Lord understood that that was not beyond what he could bear. Amazing, isn't it? Like that's incredible when you look at what Job, consider what Job went through, right? And he came out on the other side, a better man. He was blessed thoroughly even more than he was in the beginning with the Lord. But the Lord knew what he was able to bear and he overcame. You know, he had that shield of faith up. We need to do the same thing. And, and we, we can't, we do not have the right and we cannot say to God, you've tempted me beyond what I can bear. This was too much. I couldn't handle this. There's no way somebody could handle this sort of situation. Well, I think that's why we have the example of Job in the Bible. I think that's why we've got it. Um, now, as far as the power of the devil goes, now we're going to have a look at, um, you know, end times here in the Antichrist and the kind of power that he has. And if we turn to Revelation chapter 13, chapter 13, starting verse 16, So this is about the Antichrist and the power that he has over the world. And he, it says in verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There's going to come a point in time in the future where the Antichrist, which is Satan's man on earth, is going to have the power to force people to take this mark in order to buy or sell. And this will be global. Now, that's a lot of power, right? We've, I mean, throughout history, we've had some king, kingdoms and some really big kingdoms and, and rulers and whatnot, some tyrants that have, you know, conquered and controlled vast areas of, of the world. But here, this is the whole world. This is the whole world. This is incredible power. But, and one man, one man causes all this. And in Revelation 20, verse 4, 
It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Not only will the devil have, or the Antichrist have the power to cause people to take this mark in order to buy and sell, he's going to have the power to cause all those unsaved, unregenerate men and women across the world to slay all the believers or try and slay all of them and behead them. Right? He's going to have that kind of power. And point number six I want to make here, look, the devil has power, but his power is limited by God. It's limited by God. We've already seen, you know, when Satan comes before the Lord, he has to request, you know, in the case of Simon, he's, he requested that he wanted to sift him as wheat. So he's got power, but it's limited. It's not like he's just got full reign over the world and he can just do as he pleases. It is limited by God. So I want to make that point. Point number seven, point number seven, the devil is a counterfeiter. The devil is a counterfeiter. Revelation 13, Revelation chapter 13. So once again, this is in the end times. I'll try and power through the rest of this. Haven't got much more to go. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads that were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now for context here, the beast here, this is the Antichrist, and he receives this deadly wound. He receives this deadly wound. Now this, this is an amazing scene, and the whole world's going to witness this, is what the Bible teaches, and they wondered after the beast, because when he's healed of this deadly wound, he's dead. It's a deadly wound. The world sees that this man actually dies. He actually dies. And in Revelation 11, verse 7, Revelation 11, 7, I didn't write this one down on my notes, but I'll just turn there. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. For context here, this is when it says the beast coming out of the bottomless pit. What takes place here, we've already seen how Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. He has the power to do that. The Antichrist here, the beast, dies. He comes back up out of the bottomless pit and enters back into him and comes back to life. Now, the reason why I'm calling this point the devil is a counterfeiter is because what the devil is doing here is he's making, trying to make a replica of what Jesus did. When Jesus died, was buried for three days, and rose again. And this is going to be such a convincing miracle to the world because I think it really happens. The Bible says he comes out of the bottomless pit. That's the narrator of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, teaching this. This really happens. So the whole world is going to be astonished. And this is why, it, you know, the Bible says that, you know, if it were possible for the elect to be deceived, but it's not possible. If it were possible, meaning it can't happen. But it's going to be so convincing that he even... It, it, you know, almost convinces the elect, us that are saved, to believe this, right? So how easy is it going to be for the devil, to, the Antichrist, to convince the world, right? But he is a great counterfeiter and they're going, to, they're going to think to themselves, the unsaved, they're going to look at this event and think, oh, this is the real Jesus. This is the one the Scriptures t teach of. That event that took place 2,000 years ago, it must have been a lie. Why are they going to believe this? Because they love unrighteousness. That's what the Bible teaches, right? And, and, G, and, and Satan, he takes advantage of this. He knows how to fool mankind. He knows how to suck them in. And that's what he does here. And then in verse 4 it says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So the dragon here is Satan, giving power to the beast, which is the Antichrist. He enters into him. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of, the life, of, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 19.20 and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he hath deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire with, uh, with burning with brimstone. Now, the devil's the counterfeiter, right? So you've got Satan, the dragon, you've got the beast, which is the Antichrist, 
and the false prophet, it's like this is like the unholy trinity, right? There's three of them. One of them's just come back to life, you know, trying to look like the Antichrist is trying to look like Jesus, Satan being his father. You know, the, Sam preached about the lineage, right, this morning about how you know Satan has a lineage when you read Genesis 3, his seed. This is of the lineage of the devil, these three, and they are like the unholy trinity. And these three, so they're cast into the lake of fire, the, be the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And then in Revelation 20, verse 10, it reads, And the devil, this is after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, here they are all together in the lake of fire for all eternity. All three of them, burning forever. And you know what? They're the first three in the lake of fire. None of mankind has yet been cast into that lake of fire. They're in hell, awaiting that judgment at the great throne to be thrown in. You know, and this, this leads to the question, I've really got to try and speed this up. Why does the devil hate mankind? And in particular, why does he hate God's children? Why? Because he knows he's out. He knows his end. The devil is aware of this. He knows what his fate is. But in Isaiah 14, it reads... How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying... Is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did shake kingdoms? We are going to look at the devil in his final state with scorn. We're going to look at him like, this is pitiful. Is this really the man that caused all this trouble? Is this really the one? Right? He knows that this is his end and this is why he's angry. He's trying to take as many people as he can with him to his final destination. And this is why he hates us. Now, here's the thing about the devil. Look, it's futile for the devil to make, you know, war with God. God could just crush him like a bug. He can't do anything about, he can't, he can't fight the Father in heaven. He can't do anything to harm him, right? So what does he do? He takes it out on us. He takes it out on the saints. He takes it out on the children of God because that's his way of trying to get at God, the Father. That's his way of trying to hurt God. And He hates God. He hates the Father. The fact that he wants to replace him and be like the Most High is, is really clear, right? And in Revelation 12, verse 7, we're nearly finished. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. It's not just the devil. He's got his own army. He's got his own angels that look up to him and follow him. And in fact, we can see how many, because in Revelation 12 verse 4, it says this, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And, and here, for context, the stars represent the angels. A third of them end up being cast out of heaven with the devil, a third, a third followed him in his folly against God. It's just foolish, but, and their fate is eternity in that lake of fire with the devil. And in verse 10 it says, And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren has cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. We're given a little bit more insight here about the devil. When, when he goes to God, he, he makes accusations against us to God. That's what he does. He hates us. He's probably like, why do you love these people? Look at what they do. Look at what I can get them to do. Look at the sins that I can get them to commit. They're weak. They're weak. All the sorts of accusations that he would make before the Father, right? Day and night. But verse 11, Verse 11, do, do we overcome the devil? You know, do, we over, do we get saved by turning from our sins and turning from our wicked ways? No, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. You know, that's, that's comforting, right? 
that we're going to have the power to just, you know, at, at, at this point in future when the Antichrist is on the scene, that we'll not love our lives to the point of death. God will embolden us and give us power through the Holy Spirit to just go to that point, if, if that's what takes place in our lives. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Another proof text. This is why, God, why the devil, why, why Satan hates God, hates mankind, because he knows his ultimate end. And, and when he's cast out of heaven, so it, we know Satan can go to and fro across the earth and he can go up to heaven. You know, he's with the sons of God before God. He's in that heavenly assembly up until this point when he's cast out. So there's a certain point in the future where Satan's cast down to earth and he can no longer return up to heaven and be a part of that, that assembly. And even Jesus in Luke 10, 18, he says, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now Jesus is talking almost like it's past tense because he knows the end before the beginning. He's, he's seen this future event where Satan falls like lightning from heaven. So point number eight, the Lord will ultimately destroy the devil. That's his ultimate end. So just to recap, uh, point one, the devil is a fallen angel. Uh, next point, the devil is our adversary. The Lord uses the devil for his purpose. Uh, point four, the devil is a deceiver. The devil will appeal to your needs and your desires. The devil has power, but his power is limited by God. The devil is a counterfeiter. And point eight, the most beautiful point of all, the Lord will ultimately destroy the devil. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we just